This is the intro video for Lab 9 of the Upside 1299 Labs, Introduction to the Line Following Robot. So there is again a pre-lab, some reading that you should do before you come to the lab, and I'll give you some good news. This is actually the shortest lab of the whole semester. A lot of groups actually are capable of finishing this in the three-hour lab period. In Part A, you're going to be choosing a group to work with for the robot project. Hopefully you've already been talking to other students about whether or not you'd like to work together. A standard group should have three students. We do allow groups of two when we don't have sufficient numbers to make groups of three. Your lab instructors do have the right to shuffle the groups around in order to create more groups of three. You are allowed to form groups with people in other lab sections and even on other campuses as long as all of you can attend the same lab period once a week. Your lab instructors do need to see you working together. In Part B, you get to start playing with the robot. So the robot has three main systems. The first is these five reflective light sensors along its leading edge. This is what the robot uses to navigate by. The second are five LEDs along its top edge here. So these have been programmed to light up when the corresponding sensor has been triggered by a black line. So let me demonstrate what I mean. I'm going to turn on the brain board and slide a black line here. And you'll note that there's just one LED that has been lit up. If I slide the black line back and forth, different LEDs start lighting up. So it's just a case of if this sensor has been triggered, then this LED lights up. Now the most important thing you're going to be doing in Part B is finding a good threshold value to use with your robot. You'll remember in the previous experiment you graphed the response of one reflective light sensor to figure out what a good threshold value is. That is to say, what sort of a value you get when you're definitely over top of a black line. Now you want to do something similar for the whole robot. You want to choose a threshold value such that there are no blind spots. That is to say, there are no places where the black line is underneath the robot, but none of these LEDs light up. If you find a blind spot like this, then you need to adjust your threshold value such that the sensors are a little more sensitive. Now before you can do any of this, you need to program your robot. So you've been given a whole bunch of files, including a main.c file, and you're going to take those and create a project with them. Now the robots must be programmed with a picket 2. If your group doesn't have one, you'll be given one. And if you flip this guy in his nose, you'll see some pins here. So the picket 2 just plugs onto those. Now in order to program it, you need to turn on the brain board. There are two switches here, and if you can't see this too well, don't worry, there's a picture in your lab manual. But you've got an LED here and a switch on either side of those. The switch closest to the center is the brain board switch. So you need that turned on in order to program, and that will also turn on these LEDs. If you turn on the other switch, that turns on the motors. So I'll do that, and you'll see that the motors will start running depending on how this has been programmed and which sensor is currently being triggered. To save battery, it's a good idea just to leave the motors off as much as possible and the brain board too when you're not using it. Another thing to do just for safety's sake is, regardless of whether you are programming the robot or just have it sitting on your desk because you're not using it, always leave it sitting on its nose like this, wheels in the air. The reason why is that if you've got the brain board on and the motor control gets switched on accidentally, then the robot could sprint off the side of the desk and die. And you don't want that. It's very bad for your group and also for the technicians. So just to make sure that this cannot fall off the edge of the desk, always store it when it's on the desk, on its nose, with the wheels in the air. In Part C, you learn how to control the robot's wheels. So when you look in the main.c file, you'll notice that the infinite while loop doesn't actually do a whole lot. It checks the sensors, it sets the LEDs, and then it calls a function called motor control, which is located in the motor control.c file. So if you go into that, you'll find very simple code for making your robot follow simple pathways. So it can go along gentle curves, but it can't do anything much more complicated than that. Motor control calls other functions that take care of making the robot go forward or turn right or left or even stop. And all of them rely on a single function called set motor speed. Set motor speed has three parameters. One of them is called the motor, the second one's called motor speed, and the third one's called speed modifier. And what values they can take are listed down here in this table. The motor can be either right or left, so that controls either the left or the right motor. Motor speed can be stop, slow, medium, fast, or reverse slow, reverse, medium, and reverse fast. 
so that sets how fast that particular wheel is going. The speed modifier is used if you find that your wheels don't quite turn at the same rate, so if one of them is a little faster than the other, you can use the speed modifier to adjust one of them either to be faster or slower. So a speed modifier can be a positive or a negative value to speed up or slow down that wheel, but just keep in mind that you can't speed up faster than the maximum value, so if you've already got the motor traveling at fast or reverse fast, you can't use the speed modifier to go even faster. You can, however, slow down the other wheel. By the way, it's also a good idea to investigate whether you need to change the sign of the speed modifier when you change the robot's direction. So the first instruction they give you is to test your project on a simple track, an oval or maybe a figure of eight, and then you start testing it on more complicated tracks just to see how it performs. Remember to take good notes on what you observe. Scrolling down, in this instruction they want you to take your robot, turn it wheels up, and then change motor control to run the robot's wheels at every speed that they're capable of running at for several seconds. It's a good idea to stick a piece of tape on each wheel. That allows you to tell whether they're turning at the same rate. In the second instruction, they want you to modify motor control again so that the robot always goes forward, ignoring all the sensor input. And you're going to time how long it takes to go over a certain distance and figure out its speed. It's also a good idea to check whether or not it's going straight. In the next instruction, you do the same thing, except now you have the robot traveling backwards. And again, determine its speed, make sure that it's traveling straight. In scrolling down, the very last instruction is that you're going to program the robot to dance. So there's three dances down here, and you figure out how to make the robot do that. And then you're finished with this experiment. This literal pitfall is just telling you again that you need to be careful to make sure that your robot can never zoom off the side of a desk. If it's on the desk, put it on its nose so that the wheels are in the air.